I was home on Christmas break after my first semester at college. It was good to see my parents again. I had missed them while I was away. It was my first day back and I was in the den talking to mom about college life. Dad was at work when I got home so I had a warm welcome from my mother. I had only been home an hour when we heard the phone ring and mom went to answer it. From where I was I couldn't make out what she was saying but she did sound extremely concerned. It was only a couple of minutes later when she came into the den, I could tell from the look on her face that something was wrong. Rick, I need you to drive me to Mercy General, Mom said. Mercy General was one of the hospitals in town. I felt a cold chill run through my body. What is it, Mom? Is Dad okay? Yes, he's fine. That was Mrs. Miller. Penny's been in an accident, she said. A feeling of dread shot through me. Oh no, Mom. Is she okay? I don't know, Rick. Mrs. Miller is quite upset and I need to get there to be with her. Nodding, I jumped up and ran to my room and grabbed my car keys. We rushed out and quickly piled into the car. I took off rather fast causing Mom to ask me to slow down. She said it wouldn't do any good if we had an accident too. I dropped back to the speed limit. I felt my knees shaking as I drove and my mind thought about Penny, the blonde-haired girl with the big blue eyes. The Millers had moved into the house across the street when I was seven. My mother took a plate of her homemade brownies to them as a welcome to the neighborhood gift. Mom and Mrs. Miller became good friends immediately. They had a lot in common, same age. Both had grown up in small towns, both were stay-at-home mothers and wives. One difference was that Mrs. Miller had given birth to a daughter. Penny. I was born six days before Penny. I can remember watching out the front window as they moved in. The first time I saw her was the day a moving van pulled up in front of their house. It was followed by a car that parked nearby and three people got out. It was obvious that it was a married couple with a young daughter about my age. The daughter had her blonde hair braided into two pigtails that hung down on either side of her head. She looked kind of cute but I really couldn't tell from that distance. The first time I saw her up close was two days later when one of the secretaries from the front office brought her into the classroom I was sitting in. She introduced Penny to the teacher who in turn introduced her to the class as a new student who would be joining our grade. It was easy to see that Penny looked nervous as she apprehensively looked around the room. Even as a second grader, I could see how coming into a new school in the middle of the year could be a little scary. Our teacher led Penny over to the empty desk, which was next to mine, and she gave me a timid smile as she sat down. The first time I actually spoke to her was at lunch in the cafeteria. By this point in the school year everyone had already formed friendships and would sit in their own little groups while they ate. As was typical with second graders, we sat at tables that were either all boys or all girls. Our teacher had asked Penny to stay and talk to her for a few minutes after the lunch bell rang so she was the last one in line to get her food. I was sitting where I could see her as she went along the counters. George was regaling us with another one of his stories about his escapades. I wasn't really listening as I watched Penny holding her tray looking around the cafeteria uncertainty. None of the girls made an effort to ask her to sit with them so she walked to the back and sat alone at an empty table. Despite knowing that I would probably be teased by my friends later, I picked up my tray and walked back and sat down across from her. She looked surprised and again gave me a shy smile. Hi, I'm Ricky, I said. Hello Ricky. My name's Penny, she replied. Of course I already knew her name from when the teacher introduced her to the class. You live on Maple Street, right? I asked. She again gave me a surprised look. Yes, I do. How did you know that? I gave her a grin. I live across the street from you and I saw you and your mom and dad when you moved in. That was the start of our bond. She told me that her daddy had gotten a new job and they had moved here from a town about two hours away. She was sad that she had left behind all her friends. I walked with her back to class when the bell rang but we didn't have any chance to talk the rest of the day. When school let out she told me that her mom was picking her up. Parents that picked up their kids parked in front of the school and those of us who rode the bus went to the back where the buses parked. 
When I got home that afternoon my mouth began to water as soon as I walked in the door. I could smell the aroma of fresh baked brownies. I ran into the kitchen hoping for an afternoon snack. Mom laughed when she saw me and nodded at a plate of cooling squares of deliciousness on the counter. As I grabbed one and bit into it I noticed that she had a second plate that she was wrapping in tin foil. She told me that she was going to take it over to our new neighbors across the street to welcome them to the neighborhood. She was pleased when I asked if I could go with her. Mom rang the doorbell and a few seconds later Mrs. Miller opened the door. I saw Penny standing slightly behind her mother and she gave me a smile. Our mothers introduced themselves and talked for a couple of minutes before Mom introduced me to Mrs. Miller. Mrs. Miller in turn introduced her daughter Penny who told our moms that we were in the same class. Mom handed Mrs. Miller the plate of brownies and she lifted the foil and thanked my mother for the welcoming gift. She then offered one each to Penny and me. Yummy, another brownie. When we were leaving to go back to our house I told Mrs. Miller if Penny wanted to ride the bus I would make sure she got to the right place. She asked her daughter if she would like to ride the bus and Penny nodded her head. The next morning I knocked on their door and walked Penny to the bus stop and sat with her on the ride to school. I sat with her at lunch again that day even though I was robbed by several of my friends about sitting with a girl. At the end of the day we again rode the bus and I walked her home after we got off. That was the start of a daily routine for us. From that time we were almost inseparable. In the afternoons and on weekends we would play together. We both had swing sets in our backyards that we spent hours on. If the weather didn't allow us to go outside we would play games indoors. When we reached high school we still stayed together all the time. We would go out together with a group of friends even though we weren't dating. It wasn't that I didn't want to date Penny because I did. I had always had a crush on her and the older we got the stronger my feelings grew. The problem was I didn't think she thought of me as anything other than a friend who lived across the street. Our relationship stayed like this until the first week of our final year of high school. Neither of us dated anyone. I didn't know her reason but for me she was the only girl that I wanted to be with. That was when Penny's father had a massive stroke and passed away. It was after his funeral that things changed. The friends of the Millers had gathered at their house bringing food and paying their condolences. Penny was sitting in a chair in the corner crying and it broke my heart. I went over and put my arm around her shoulder. I stumbled back totally stunned. I stared at her as she put her face back into her hands and sobbed. I didn't know what to do. I hung my head and walked out the front door and over to my house. I went to my room and fell on my bed and cried. I cried for Penny and her loss. Her father had meant the world to her, and I knew how hard this was on her. As far as what she had said to me, I just hoped that she didn't mean it and was just hurting. I didn't see Penny for the rest of the week as she stayed home from school. As much as I wanted to go to her and console her, I thought about her words and decided it would be best to give her time to grieve. The following Monday, though I waited for her in my car, we always took it to school. I was surprised when she walked past me and headed to the bus stop. I backed out and pulled up to where she was standing with a couple of other kids. She just glared at me. I told you to go away. She snapped at me. I stared at her for a minute, then slowly drove away. I was really hurting now. My best friend and the girl I was secretly in love with had turned against me. I hurried to class and hid behind a book so no one would see that I had been crying. We had always sat at the same table at lunch, but today she went to another table and wouldn't even look in my direction. That afternoon, when I got home I talked to my mother about what was going on with Penny. She tried to soothe my hurt feelings and told me to be patient. She said Penny was hurting and would come around soon. I hope so, but it wasn't to be. Penny quit hanging out with our friends and soon she was dating a jock from the baseball team and went out with a different group. I was heartbroken. For the rest of our senior year we going out with our friends and just stayed home. Mom was worried about me. But she didn't push me. I'm pretty sure she knew how I felt. The worst times were on the weekends when her boyfriend would pull up in front of her house and honk his horn. From my bedroom window I would see her run out to his car and get in. In defense I poured myself into my schoolwork. Graduation came 
and I headed off to college. I graduated high school with honors, and had been accepted to a major university, about 200 miles from home. I had only made it back for Thanksgiving and now for Christmas. The last words Penny had ever spoken to me was the day she told me to go away at the bus stop. Now the only girl I had ever loved was in the hospital, and I was driving mom to be with Mrs. Miller. I dropped mom off at the front doors and told her I would find a place to park and come find her. I hurried and found a place and rushed back in. I went to the check-in desk and asked where I could find Penny and was given her room number on the second floor. I found the elevator, made my way to her room. Peeking in the door I saw mom sitting in a chair with her arms around Mrs. Miller comforting her. My mother looked up to see me standing there and nodded that it was okay for me to enter. When I came in, I looked at the bed and saw Penny laying there. Her left arm was in a cast and her head was bandaged. She had an IV needle taped to one of her arms and a heart monitor beeped with each pulse. My heart was breaking at the sight of the girl I loved in this condition. I had to fight the urge to rush over and hold her. Instead I took a seat on the other side of Mrs. Miller. Mrs. Miller was like a second mother to me, and I hurt for her as well as Penny. Eventually she told us that Penny had gone to the mall with a girlfriend, and they were on the way home when a pickup ran a red light. The car Penny was in hit the truck broadside, and she was sitting in the passenger seat. She had broken her arm, but her worst injury was due to her head hitting the dashboard. The doctor said it would be some time before they knew how serious it was. They were keeping her in a chemically induced coma for the time being. After that we sat in silence. The only noise coming from the beeps of the heart monitor. It started getting late and mom said we needed to get home so she could fix dinner for dad. I didn't want to leave, but since I had driven her here I had to go. Mrs. Miller thanked us for coming. We asked her if we could do anything for her and she just asked if we could look after her little dog. We assured her we would, and I told her I would be back in the morning. I slept fitfully that night. My dreams were filled with Penny. I ate a quick breakfast the next morning and hurried back to the hospital. Mrs. Miller was still there in the room. I saw they had brought in a rollaway bed for her, and that she was awake sitting in a chair next to Penny's bed. When I walked in she came and gave me a hug. We sat and talked for a while. She said, the doctors were going to keep Penny in a drug-induced coma for another few days until the brain swelling went down and then they would allow her to awaken on her own. Mrs. Miller said she needed to run home and shower and change. I promised her I would stay with Penny. When she had left I sat in the chair next to Penny's bed and gently took her good hand in mine and held it. I talked to her softly telling her she had to get better. Tears streamed from my eyes as I talked. At one point a nurse came in. I went to get up but she just smiled at me and told me to stay seated. When Mrs. Miller came back, I was still talking to Penny and didn't hear her come in. I stared at her approach and jumped up. No, Ricky, stay where you are. I know you're hurting as much as I am, she said. I nodded gratefully. She's going to be okay. I just know it, I said. I'm sorry that she turned away from you Rick. I know that she loves you, but she has had such a hard time with her father's death. That's okay, she has her own life to live. All I want is for her to get better, I said. I stayed until visiting hours were over and was back early the next day. The next five days were the same. I would be there early every morning and go home when they said I had to leave. On the third day, they quit giving her the drugs to keep her in the coma. It wasn't until her fifth day in the hospital that she opened her eyes. Her mom and I were sitting and talking quietly when we looked over to see her looking at us. Mrs. Miller gasped and I jumped up to go find the nurse to tell her that Penny was awake. I rushed back to her room but when the doctor came in he asked me to wait outside. I paced back and forth nervously waiting for any word on how she was doing. Finally Mrs. Miller came out in tears. I ran over and hugged her. She's awake and talking, but she doesn't even know who I am, she sobbed. We waited together until the doctor finally came out. He looked a little perplexed. Mrs. Miller, from what I can tell your daughter, is suffering from a case of amnesia. She doesn't seem to recall anything about her life. Now this isn't totally uncommon in cases of head trauma, and she should recover her memories. 
What I can't tell you is how long that will take. Mrs. Miller nodded. What can we do? She asked. Just be with her and talk to her. Hopefully this will help bring her memory back. The doctor left and we went back into Penny's room. Mrs. Miller went to her daughter. Hello Penny. I'm so glad you're awake. Penny looked at her mother confused. I'm your mother, dear. You've been in an accident. Penny looked at her and nodded. She then looked over at me with the same confused look. This is Rick. He's your best friend, Mrs. Miller said. Hello Rick, she said tentatively. Hello Penny. I'm glad you're awake, I said. We spent the next two hours talking to Penny, until I had to go home. I rushed into the house and told my parents that Penny was awake, but she couldn't remember anything. When I went to bed that night I said a prayer for her, as I had every night. I thanked God that she had come to, and asked him to give her back her lost memories. For the next week, there was no change in Penny's condition. She was still in the hospital on Christmas Day. I spent Christmas morning with my family, and then went to see her. Even though she had lost her memory of who she was, she still knew what Christmas was. I bought her a present and gave it to her. She opened the box and took out the chain of white gold that had a purple gem hanging from it. She looked pleased with the gift and I told her that it was an amethyst and it was her birthstone. Penny smiled and asked my help to put it on. She still had her arm in a cast. On New Year's Eve the doctor said he was going to release her, explaining that she would be better off at home in familiar conditions. He felt that would help stimulate her memory. I helped Mrs. Miller get her home and we watched as Penny walked around the house looking at everything as if it was the first time she had ever seen them. It was disheartening to watch her. That night my family came over, and we rang in the new year together. On New Year's morning Mrs. Miller came over to talk with us. My company has been very gracious in giving me time off, but I have to go back to work. I don't want to leave Penny alone, even though Mr. Miller had enough insurance at the time of his death to pay off the house. Mrs. Miller still had to work to provide for them. Mom reached over and took her hands. Dana, I will be here, and I will be happy to look after her. I'll be here too. I blurted out. Rick, you need to go back to school, my mother said. I'm not going back now. Penny needs all of us. I said adamantly. I'll go back next semester, but this is more important. Mom looked at me intently, and then nodded her head. Penny was like a daughter to her, and she knew how much she meant to me. Dad didn't object either. I called the school and explained what was going on, and they let me drop my classes and credited the money towards the next semester. For the next couple of months, Penny would come over to our house every day while her mother went to work. We would sit and talk as I tried to help her get her memory back. I remember when you had just moved here, I said. Your parents left you with us, and it started to rain, and you and I snuck outside and played in the puddles. When Mom came out, we were covered in mud. Penny giggled. For real. Mom was sitting in the room listening to us. It's true. I spanked you both for being out there. Oh my. Penny said with a blush. And then when we were ten, we thought it would be cool to sneak out and spend the night in my fort. Our parents were frantic the next day, when they found us gone and had the whole neighborhood looking for us. I don't know about you, but I got a spanking I still remember. Were we always so mischievous? Penny asked. No, sweetie. You were both usually the most loving and well-behaved children, but you did have your moments. Mom said. Penny looked thoughtful. I just wish I could remember, she said. We would sit and talk about our childhood day after day. Rather it was me telling her stories about us and her listening and sometimes asking questions. Despite how much I wished she would remember she didn't, Mrs. Miller even asked other friends of Penny to come visit. They would come by once or twice, but then not come again. I believe they found it too disconcerting to talk to someone they knew who couldn't remember them. Summer was approaching and I was coming to the conclusion that my being there wasn't helping. Penny. I talked to my parents about returning to school. The summer semesters were short, but I could get back on track. It was time to get on with my life, even as much as I loved being able to be with her again. I felt inside that if she regained her memory she would reject me again. It was our last day together, 
as I was returning to school the next day. We were sitting in her room as we often did. I was having a hard time thinking of anything to talk about, as I had verbally replayed just about our entire life. Rick, did you and I ever date? She asked, catching me off guard. No, we never dated. I said trying to keep the sadness from my voice. Oh, it just seems that we were so close. Yeah, we were together for a long time, I said. You say that like we're not close anymore. Did something happen between us? Until now I had purposely not talked about the events following her father's passing. Then it hit me like a bolt of lightning. That was one thing we had never talked about, her father. Penny had never even asked about him. She had lots of pictures in her room. And she had asked me about who each person was except for her father. It was as if she was purposely blocking him out. I jumped up and told her that I needed to talk to her mother and to wait there for me. I found Mrs. Miller in the kitchen. Has Penny ever asked you about her father? I questioned. She thought about it and answered. No. Now that you mention it, she never has. She has never asked me about him either. I may be way off base here, but I think that might be what she's blocking out. If it's okay with you I like to take her for a drive. She said that would be fine and I went back and asked Penny to come with me. She wanted to know where we were going, but I just told her to trust me. Twenty minutes later, we were pulling up in front of the cemetery. Penny looked at me questioningly and it didn't protest when I took her hand and led her through the gates. We stopped in front of one particular grave. Penny, this is where your father is buried, I said. She looked at the headstone and the name and date engraved on it. I reached into the large envelope that Mrs. Miller had given me and drew out the picture it contained. I handed it to Penny. This is your father. You two were very close and he loved you very much. I whispered. We stood there in silence for a long time as Penny studied the picture and then looked at the headstone. She finally turned to me and shook her head. I wish I could remember him, she said with tears in her eyes. I was disappointed that the breakthrough that I had been hoping for was not happening. I took her by the hand and led her back to the car and drove her home. When we got there I told her I needed to go finish packing. We said goodbye and I promised to stop by and see her one last time before I left for school. The next morning I loaded my bags into my car and walked across the street. It was a Saturday so Mrs. Miller was home. The three of us sat at the kitchen table and talked for some time. When it was time to leave I gave Mrs. Miller and Penny a hug. As I was walking out of the kitchen I heard Penny speak in a voice so low that I barely heard her. I'm sorry. Ricky, she said. I spun around and looked at her. She had called me Ricky. That was what I went by when I was younger. Now I was Rick. What did you say? I asked. Tears began to stream down her cheeks. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the way I treated you. You remember? I shouted with hope. Penny stood with her head bowed, looking at the floor and nodded. Yes, I had a dream last night about Daddy. And when I woke up this morning I could remember everything. Mrs. Miller and I let out whoops of joy and both hugged her between us. Darling, why didn't you say anything this morning when you got up? Mrs. Miller asked. Penny's body shook with a sob. Because I knew that Ricky was going to come by and I am so embarrassed at how I treated him after. Daddy died. I'm so sorry Ricky. I put my hand under her chin and lifted her head so I could look into her face. It's okay, Penny. All that matters is that you're going to be okay now. That's what's important. Penny sobbed again and threw her arms around my neck. I loved you, Ricky, but when Daddy died I felt so cheated that you still had your dad and I didn't have mine anymore. It hurt so much. I'm so sorry for how I treated you. I really have missed you. I squeezed her tight. I've missed you too. So much. I put off leaving for school until the next day. We had a celebration that our Penny was back. Mom and Dad came over as soon as I called and told them of her breakthrough. Later that evening Penny took me out back and we sat together on a garden bench. Penny sat quietly before breaking the silence. How come you don't hate me? She asked softly. I decided it was the time to tell her the truth. I could never hate you Penny.
I have always been in love with you way too much for that. You love me, she asked. I nodded my head. Why didn't you ever tell me? I guess I was scared. I didn't want to take the chance that it would ruin our friendship, I replied. Me too, Penny said. I didn't think you felt like I did, because you never said anything. You wouldn't even ask me out on a date. I have always loved you too. But how about Jim? I asked, referring to the jock that she had dated. I think that was just my way of trying to deal with things. I never loved him, and we never did anything. Well, we did kiss, but that was all. And it really wasn't that good because I knew he wasn't the one I wanted to kiss. We stared into each other's eyes. Slowly our heads moved closer, and when our lips met, I felt a jolt of electricity surge through me. This turned to fireworks. My arms wrapped around her, pulling her tight, as I poured years of love into the passion of our first kiss. We were both gasping for breath when our mouths parted. Penny moved to sit in my lap and pulled me in for another kiss. I shivered when she ran her hand through my hair pulling my face to hers. I was praying that she felt what I was. Her lips moved to my ear. I love you, Ricky, she whispered, my arms tighten their hold on her body. I love you too, Penny. I love you. We spent the next hour kissing and talking softly until Mrs. Miller stepped out the back door to check on us. She saw her daughter sitting in my lap and gave us a smile and went back inside. Penny and I rose up and walked back into the house. As we came into the living room holding hands where Mrs. Miller sat with my parents we were met with smiles from each. I thought parting from her that night to return to my house was hard. The next day Penny and her mother came to my house to tell me goodbye. My first class was the next day and I had to leave. I said my farewells to her parents and Penny walked me out to my car. We melted into each other's arms and kissed with a passion that matched our kisses from the night before. Finally Penny pulled back and stared into my eyes as tears dripped from hers. I love you. I'll be waiting for you, she said. Short of her telling me she was coming with me there were no other words that could have meant more to me. If I thought parting with her the night after our first kiss was hard, the next six weeks were torture. The only thing that helped me get through them was the unlimited long distance plan on my cell phone that let me call her every night. I was taking two courses during this shortened semester and would go to class each day and then study when I got back to the dorm. I would get in bed an hour before I needed to go to sleep and call her and we would talk. My last day of class I had already packed my belongings and put them in my car before I took my final exam. Once I had turned in my text I walked straight to the car and started driving. The four hour trip home seemed more like 10. As soon as I pulled into the driveway our front door flew open and Penny raced across the lawn and jumped into my arms. As she kissed me deeply, I knew that I would never get tired of kissing her. When I did finally set her back on the ground I looked over to see my mother patiently waiting on the porch. I put my arm around Penny and went to hug mom. Later when we were alone she told me that Penny had come over three hours before I was expected to wait for me. She laughed when she said that Penny had looked as nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. Penny and I spent every waking moment together during the weekend. I took her to see a movie Saturday night so we could have some time alone. As I sat in the darkened theater with my arm around her shoulder I couldn't help thinking about my dad telling me how he used to take my mother to the drive-in movies when they were dating. Too bad the last one in our area had closed down years ago. We didn't let that stop us from sharing a few kisses. Sunday night Penny told me to wait until her mother had left for work and then come over to her house. She said she would leave the door unlocked for me. I was up early Monday morning and ate breakfast with my parents. When my father left for work I went back up to my room. Mrs. Miller normally left for her job about an hour after my dad did and I could watch her driveway from my window. After she had driven away I went back downstairs and told my mother that I was going to meet Penny. It looked like mom wanted to say something but she just nodded and said okay. I quickly crossed the street and knocked on the door before opening it and stepping inside the house. I didn't see Penny but heard music playing and followed the sound to her room. She was standing in the center of her room dressed in a robe. I walked in and she came and met me halfway and our arms wrapped around each other as our lips met in a deep kiss. Penny took my hand and sat me on the edge of her bed. She remained standing in front of me. She appeared very nervous but with a sigh her hands pulled at the sash that held her robe closed. I drew in a sharp breath as I gazed on her. For several seconds my eyes traveled over every inch. When I looked into her beautiful blue eyes they were begging me to say something. 
Oh God, Penny, you are more beautiful than I ever imagined, I said huskily. Her eyes lit up and she finally smiled. Of course I knew that I was the first man she had ever seen unclothed in the flesh, as she was the first woman I have seen. We had both confessed that we had no prior experience. Don't get me wrong, I am familiar with the sight of unclothed women. In this day and age of the internet I have seen probably every shape and size of woman that there is. I put my arms around her waist and pulled her against me. The feel of her skin pressing against mine was heavenly. We kissed passionately before we explored the nooks crannies of the new grounds with our mouths. Was that okay, I said with a chuckle as I repeated her question back to her later on. Penny playfully slapped my chest. You damn well know what you did to me. We cuddled and talked for the next hour. We agreed with each other that our first time together was so much more intense and fulfilling than either of us had ever imagined it could be. This was also when Penny decided to give me more wonderful news. She said that she had been able to secure financial aid and would be entering the same school I was attending in the fall. The idea of returning to school and not being with her had plagued me, but now all my prayers had been answered. We made love one more time before showering again and getting dressed. We knew that my mom would be making lunch for us and didn't want her having to come look for us. When we did walk in together, my mother didn't say a word but just looked at both intently. I noticed Penny blush slightly and I swear. Just for a second, I saw a smile tug at the corners of my mother's mouth. We had six weeks before we left for school. We made love almost every day that her mother was at work. I'm sure by now that it was no secret to any of our parents, but we did try to remain discreet. On the day we left for school, Penny rode with me. She left her car at home as she didn't figure we would need more than one at school. Another stroke of good fortune was that she got a room in my dorm. It was a four-story code dorm. The first and third floors were for female students and the second and fourth floors were male. There wasn't anything to prevent the opposite sex from being on the other floor. Penny had a roommate, but she rarely ever saw her as she stayed with me. I was fortunate enough to have a single room. Time flew by, and we were soon back home for the Christmas holidays. Shortly after we got home, I talked with my dad about my plans and he agreed to loan me some money to buy a present for Penny. On Christmas morning, she and her mother joined my parents and me at our house to open presents. I saved mine for her until last. She was sitting on the couch between our mothers when I walked over and dropped to one knee. Penny gave me a curious look. Penny, I have known you and loved you almost my entire life. I know that we still have some time to go before we graduate, but I was hoping that when the time was right, you would honor me by becoming my wife. At that point, I opened the small jewelry box revealing the ring I had bought. It was white gold with two diamonds on either side of a larger amethyst. The stone matched the one that I had given her in the hospital exactly one year ago. Penny's eyes filled with tears. Oh yes, my Ricky, I will marry you, she cried out. All three women now had tears dropping down their cheeks as I took the ring out and placed it on her left hand. Our family celebrated the day with us. It truly was a Merry Christmas. We continued to basically live out of my room for the rest of the school year. The following summer, we both got jobs and saved up our money. That was when we told our parents that we would be renting an apartment together when we returned to school. There were no protests. I went on to graduate a semester before Penny. Six days after she graduated, we were married. Up until then, the two best days of my life were the first day we made love and the day she agreed to be my wife. The day that she said I do made three pivotal and joyous days of my life. For a while, I thought there would never be another day that could match those three, but I was wrong. I know now as I stand in the hospital room with my wife that this is another blessed day. You see, I have just had my first daughter placed into my arms. Penny is smiling as she watches the tears of joy drop from my eyes as I gaze on this precious bundle. Life with Penny is a wonderful thing. 